Cyrus, when you're getting your PhD and you're, you're digging deep into this stuff and you're uncovering these studies that date back decades and decades, was this, and, and when you would kind of present this to your colleagues or you know, whoever you were working with at the time, were they on board with what you were finding and kind of the path that you were blazing? Or are they, were they more on the conventional path of like, hey, this isn't really the way we do this? No, no, they, they were very supportive actually, mm -hmm. because you know whether it was talking to other graduate students or whether it was talking to my advisor um, or even some of the other professors, you know, I would be explaining the results of the research. So it was like, you know, my story was one thing. Okay, fine. It's an anecdotal experience. It makes sense. But then when you translate that and you start to get the same results in laboratory animals, because that's the, the, what you're supposed to be doing in graduate school, you know, we were running a whole collection of experiments to induce insulin resistance in mice using dietary methods and then reverse that using either intermittent fasting or diet or exercise. So we were- And the way that you induce a diabetic response in an animal is to, is to put them on a pretty high fat diet, right? So, so that was another yeah. epiphany for me, right? I'm sitting here with, you know, tasked with the, with the objective of trying to make animals insulin resistant so that we can use them as a testing ground. And when I started looking in the literature, I was like, how do I make an animal insulin resistant? Okay, I probably gotta give them a high fructose diet or a high sucrose diet. Uh, and so I was looking in the literature with that preconceived notion and then it would, I would read, you know, uh, we induced insulin resistance in laboratory animals by feeding them a diet containing 70% saturated fat uh, for eight weeks. We induced insulin resistance, we induced type two diabetes in laboratory animals, you know, by feeding them a high fat diet, high fat diet, high fat diet. And I was like, this is unreal. You feed animals a high fat diet and they develop diabetes. Why is it that when, when in, the, in the public, when you say the word diabetes, the first association with the people makers is sugar. Right. Right? Yeah, I had Neil Bernard on the podcast. I, I just put an episode up with him last night, but I had did a previous episode with him where we talked a lot about this and yeah. people went crazy. They're like, that can't be true. Because he was talking about the real cause of this condition is people eating too much fat. Yeah, 100%. And that it's just, yeah, that, that flies in the face of everything that you thought that you knew. The about. disconnect between the research and what the public believes and understands is mind boggling. It's, it's massive. Mm -hmm. Absolutely mind boggling. Mm -hmm. All right, so you have this epiphany. <clears throat> so I have this epiphany and then, um, you know, I, I, start, I start to realize, okay, wait a minute. The high fat diet that leads to insulin resistance, insulin resistance being the underlying cause of prediabetes, mm -hmm. prediabetes being the underlying cause of type two diabetes, right? The, the stepwise progression is person develops insulin resistance, they then progress to prediabetes, they then progress to type two diabetes. That affects 90% of the diabetes population, right? Type ones like Robbie and I are like eight to 10% of the population. Mm -hmm. So that story, I was like, wait a minute, okay. So, so does this mean that it could be that people who are eating high fat diets in the real world are actually developing a state of insulin resistance that can then progress to type two diabetes themselves? And the answer is absolutely, because these studies have also been done in humans and the way to induce insulin resistance in a human being, which we'll get into a thousand times more detail, is by feeding them a high fat diet. Right. In terms of the statistics, obviously there's been an explosion in the incidence of, of type two. Is it similar with type one or has that remained kind of a stable data point? That's a, that's a phenomenal question, actually. It's growing. It's growing, yeah. yeah. Over the past 10 years, there's been a 23% increase in type one diabetes. And this is the first time in human history that we've ever seen that. Mm. And so scientists are really th shrugging their shoulders and throwing up their hands and they're saying, we don't know why, because type one diabetes has historically only affected the same proportion of the population. So as the population grows, the proportion of the population stays flat. But now we're actually seeing an increase in the, in the proportion of the population that's diagnosed with autoimmune conditions in general, type one diabetes for sure. And uh, you know, who knows why that's happening. Right. So type one is essentially, they're still trying to figure out what, what the kind of initial cause of this is, but essentially your pancreas just stops functioning properly and it's not secreting insulin. Yeah, so, so uh, for clarity, your pancreas basically has many, many, many functions. So there's what's called an exocrine function and an endocrine function. So the exocrine function is, is what 99% plus of your pancreas is, require, is, is occupied doing. And that exocrine function is to make digestive hormones, I'm sorry, digestive enzymes, such that when you eat food, 
you can digest that food. These are like amylases. These are, these are hydrases. These are proteases. These are lipases, right? The other 1% of your, of, of your pancreas has, is endocrine. Endocrine be, meaning it's these cells secrete hormones into your blood. And then those travel to various tissues to elicit their biological effect. Mm -hmm. So the beta cells are part of these things called islets clusters. And the beta cells are responsible for making insulin. And so those guys secrete insulin into your blood. And when you develop type one diabetes, the autoimmune reaction is effectively your own immune system that has been sort of tricked or hijacked into believing and, and, and targeting beta cells for destruction. So your own immune system is manufacturing antibodies that basically go and they, they target proteins on the cell surface of beta cells and they end up disabling those beta cells. Right. So you end up losing insulin production. And as a result of that, 99 plus percent of your pancreas is functioning just fine. It's that 1% that's not functioning. And all of a sudden that's non-recoverable.